First, look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and complete questions 1 to 7 on the table. Good morning, Blue Harbour Cruises. How can I help you? Oh, um, um, good morning. Um, can you tell me something about the different cruises you run? Well, we run three cruises every day, each offering something slightly different. Oh, let me just get a pencil so I can make a note of this. Right. Firstly, there's the highlight cruise, then we do the noon cruise, and we also have our coffee cruise. Hmm. Could you tell me a bit about them? When they leave, how often, that sort of thing? Well, the highlight cruise is $16 per person, and that leaves at 9.30 every morning and takes two hours to go around the harbour. Right, 9.30. And do you get coffee or refreshments? No, but there's a kiosk on board where you can buy drinks and snacks, and we do provide everyone with a free souvenir postcard. Right. And then there's our noon cruise at $42 per person. Th this is more expensive, but... Of course, it takes longer, and for that price, you get a three-course lunch. Oh, that sounds good. And what about the last one? That's the coffee cruise. Well, that's $25 each. It takes two and a half hours. When does that leave? At a quarter past two daily. And presumably the coffee is included? Yes, and sandwiches are served free of charge. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, answer questions 8 to 10. I think the coffee cruise would suit us best, as lunch is included at the hotel. Can I book for two people for tomorrow, please? No need to book. Just be down at the quay at 2 o'clock. All our cruises depart from jetty number 2. Can you tell me where that is exactly? Yes. Number 2 jetty is opposite the shops. It's clearly signposted. Right. And can you tell me, is there a commentary? Yes, there's a commentary on all the cruises. Is it possible to listen to the commentary in Japanese? My friend doesn't speak much English. It's in English only, I'm afraid. But the two guides usually speak some Japanese, so she'll be able to ask questions. Oh, fine. Oh, and one other thing. I should just mention that it gets extremely hot on the upper deck at this time of year, so it's a good idea to wear a hat. Otherwise, you could get quite badly sunburnt. Right, I'll remember that. Thanks very much. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You are going to hear a guide named Matt, who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, good morning, everybody. 
My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax, there are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a Beachcombers and Rock Hoppers tour exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in. But I would recommend my favorite tour, the Waterfall Walk. This departs at sundown each day and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the National Park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea, too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, it's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the National Park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two university students, Phil and Stella, talking to their tutor about their research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27 on pages 69 and 70.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Come in. Ah, yes, Stella. Is Phil there too? Mm -hmm. Good. Come on in. OK, so you're here to discuss your research projects. Have you decided what to focus on? You were thinking of something about the causes of mood changes, weren't you? Yes, but the last time we saw you, you suggested we narrowed it down to either the effects of weather or urban environment. So we've decided to focus on the effects of weather. Right, that's more manageable. So your goal is, uh, Phil? To prove the hypothesis, no, to investigate the hypothesis that the weather has an effect on a person's mood. Hmm, good. And uh, what's your thesis, Stella? Well, our thesis is that in general, when the weather's good, it has a positive effect on a person's mood, and bad weather has a negative effect. Hmm. Uh, can you define your terms here? For example, what do you mean by good and bad? OK. Well, good would be sunny, warm weather, and bad would be when it's cold and cloudy or raining. And how would you define an effect on a person's mood? What would you be looking to find? An effect on the way a person feels. Mm. Uh, a change in the way they feel? Um, like from feeling happy and optimistic to sad and depressed. Right. And what sort of weather variables will you be looking at? Oh, sunshine, temperature, cloudiness, precipitation, among others. It'll depend a bit what the weather's like when we do the survey. Fine. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what about background reading? I gave you some suggestions. Did you manage to read any of it? Yes. We read the Ross Vickers article, the one comparing the groups of American Marines training in summer and winter. Hmm. That's quite relevant to our study. It was interesting because the Marines who were training in the cold winter conditions tried to cheer themselves up by thinking of warm places, but it didn't really work. Hmm. Yes. They were trying to force themselves to have a positive mental outlook, but in fact it had the opposite effect, and they ended up in a very negative state of mind. And we found some more research by someone who wasn't on the reading list you gave us, George Whitebourne. He compared people living in three countries with very different climatic conditions. Actually, he looked at several things, not just the weather. But he found some people's reactions to bad weather were much worse than others, and it was linked to how stressed they were generally. Uh, the weather on its own didn't have such a significant effect on mood. And we looked at a paper by Haver... Haverton. Yeah. He broke weather up into about 15 or 16 categories and did qualitative and quantitative research. He found that humans respond to conditions in the weather with immediate responses such as fear or amazement. But these responses can also be linked to associations from their earlier life, such as a particular happy or sad event. Uh, did you have a look at Stanfield's work? Yes. It was interesting because the type of questions he asked were similar to what we were planning to use in our survey. Yes. He asked people how they were feeling on days with good and bad weather. He found the biggest factor seemed to be the humidity, Moods were most negative on days with a lot of rainfall. Long periods without sunshine had some effect, but nothing like as much. Hmm. That could be quite a useful model for your project. Yes, we thought so too. Although we can't continue our survey for as long as he did. He did his over a six-month period. You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30 on page 70. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Right. Well, you've made quite a good start. Uh, so, where are you going from here? Well, 
We've already made the questionnaire we're going to use for the survey. It's quite short, just eight questions. We're aiming to survey 20 people over a period of three months from October to December. We can't specify the actual dates yet because it depends on the weather. We want to do the survey on days with a range of different weather conditions. And we'll just be working on campus, so our data will only be statistically sound for the student population here. That's OK. Have you thought how you'll determine what will constitute each aspect of weather and how many you're looking at? We decided on four. The amount of sunshine, cloudiness, temperature and precipitation. We thought we might use the internet to get data on weather conditions on the days we do the survey, but we haven't found the information we need, so we might have to measure it ourselves. We'll see. Then we've got to analyse the results, and we'll do that using a spreadsheet, giving numeric values to answers. And then, of course, we have to present our findings to the class, and we want to make it quite an interactive session. We want to involve the class in some way in the presentation, maybe by trying to create different climatic conditions in the classroom, <laughs> but we're still thinking about it. I see. Well, that sounds as if you're on the right lines. Now, what I'd suggest that you think about, in addition to the work you've done... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a talk about waste and waste treatment. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'll be talking about the issue of waste, which has become an immense problem in today's society. We face huge challenges in terms of reducing its creation in the first place, and then in dealing with it when it has been created. Now, the model of nature would be our ideal, a completely cyclical system in which no excess waste is generated that can't be processed by itself. However, we humans have proved, despite our apparent intelligence and ingenuity, quite incapable of achieving this. Where did it all go wrong? We have evidence that in ancient Greece and Rome, governments operated municipal waste collection and a huge Stone Age mound was identified some years ago in Norway as waste disposal. So we can see that people have been generating waste for a very long time indeed. However, during the Dark Ages, sophisticated municipal waste processing disappeared. The medieval answer to waste was to throw it out of the window. But this waste apart from broken pottery and a few metal objects, was largely organic. This meant, of course, that it was quickly absorbed into the environment by the natural processes of decay. However, many concerned people, such as doctors, claimed that this created health problems, although it wasn't until science produced convincing evidence of the connection between rubbish and disease that governments began to see the importance of dealing with the problem effectively. Unfortunately, their response has remained slower than the generation of waste. It is very hard to deal with waste that won't melt into the environment, as so many of our modern consumer goods won't. And that's why the invention of plastic has caused the worst headache for the environment. It's more than nature can deal with. Now you have some time to look at questions 35 to 37.
Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 35 to 37. In order to address the root of the problem of waste, we need to think about what has made the quantity of waste accelerate in growth. I'd identify three main reasons. As many countries became industrialized, we saw the advent of mass manufacturing. This has been enormously damaging as it has greatly increased the amount of things on the planet's surface which don't go away by themselves. Closely related to this is packaging, necessary for transporting things around the world, but then extremely difficult to get rid of properly. And a third aspect to the problem has been disposable goods. We have become accustomed to so many things being to use and then discard, that we find it hard to imagine life without them. And yet we spare little thought for where they go when we do discard them. Now you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 38 to 40. Right now, let's move on from where all this waste comes from to what is done with it all now it's here. Different countries deal with waste differently. Of course, each country also changes what it does, so the figures for waste treatment I've got here are likely to change in the future. Let's look at municipal solid waste, or MSW. MSW is important to consider because it's effectively a measurement of consumerism, how much waste people produce that goes beyond the absolute basic requirements in life to eat and drink. One of the main ways of dealing with MSW is incineration, burning it. This is adopted variously around the world. The UK burns relatively little waste, as does the US, while Denmark burns about half of all waste, and Japan uses this method for as much as three quarters. These are broad brushstrokes, of course, because an important issue is how efficient and clean the burning process is. Another major form of waste treatment is using landfill sites, basically burying the waste in the earth. Currently, this method is the dominant process used in the UK at over 80% and is also heavily used in Germany and in the US, while densely populated and mountainous countries such as Switzerland and Japan dispose of relatively little this way. A third and much better way of dealing with waste is to recycle it, turning it back into more things we need. It must be said that much depends here on whether further waste is generated by the recycling processes themselves. The UK and Japan have rather poor records in recycling, while Switzerland tops the table in this respect, and reasonably impressive levels are achieved by Denmark and Germany. I really hope that if we all gathered here again ten years from now, these figures would be much higher. Time and a lot of effort will tell. You now have half a minute to check your answers.